The myth of giants had been told throughout modern times as well as ancient literature. I'm sure you can all imagine a time when you were just a kid when your parents would tell you about these big wandering giants. But really, where did this myth come from? And are there giants that walk among us? Now, believe it or not, giants actually do exist, but maybe not like the ones you see in fairy tales. Technically, around 0.6% of the population is affected by this condition. And you guessed it, it's called gigantism. Here in the museum, we have an array of medical skeletons, but they average from 5'2 to 5'6. But out there, there are skeletons that are much larger. Around six months ago, a colleague of mine at the Anatomy of Death Museum in Michigan reached out with an incredible skeleton that came into his possession. He thought it would be of more interest to the Bone Museum here in Brooklyn, New York. So we are currently in the process of collaborating to get this skeleton from Michigan to New York City. Here at the Bone Museum, we believe in open accessibility and education. We want you guys at home to be able to see different types of medical collections that exist all over the United States. And over the course of this video, my partner Masha is gonna be joining me. We're gonna take you through a little bit more about the history of gigantism, as well as context around our medical collection. Here at the Bow Museum, we pride ourselves in showcasing extraordinary aspects of human biology as well as medical history. And nothing says extraordinary quite like the skeleton we're about to show you. So what is gigantism? Gigantism is a rare medical condition that typically presents in childhood when there's an excess of growth hormones. That brings us to the cause. In 95% of cases of gigantism, it is triggered by adenomas or growths in the anterior pituitary gland. Gigantism is typically defined by the rapid growth from childhood until puberty. Now, is gigantism genetic? While genetic mutations such as duplications in genes and variations in proteins can cause gigantism, in 50% of cases, there is no genetic link. Distinguishing gigantism from mere height variations is crucial. People with gigantism aren't just tall and aren't just in the 1% of their height percentile, they're way above average. If the 1 percentile of height for their sex, gender, and age is 6 foot 5, someone with gigantism would be 7 foot 5. In 1901, during the excavation of the Mastaba K2 tomb, archaeologists discovered the remains of a pharaoh. However, the remains that they found were over 6 feet tall. Considering the average height in ancient Egypt was between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 6, that was an unusual find. Dating 4,700 years back, he is the first known person to have had this condition. The pharaoh was King Sanacht of the 3rd dynasty of Egypt, and dating 4,700 years back, he is the first known person to have had this condition. Some of the most well-known giants in history are Robert Waldo, who was 8 foot 11, and is the tallest recorded man in history. Fyodor Makhov, who was born in modern-day Belarus, was regarded as the tallest man in history, measuring over 9 foot 3. However, the traditional Belarusian outfits worn during that time period gave him a taller appearance and also added a foot to his height. And according to historical photographs, it looks like he was about only 7 foot 10. Richard Keel, an American actor, was 7 foot 2. Anna Haining Bates, also known as Anna Swan, was 7 foot 11 and is known as one of the tallest women in history. The tallest woman in the world was Zheng Jianlian from China, and she was 8 foot 1 and passed away in 1982. Ted Cassidy, who played the original Lurch in the Addams Family show, actually had acromegaly, and Carol Steichen, who played Lurch in the Addams Family revival in the 1990s, also had acromegaly. And they were both about 7 feet tall. While gigantism is exceptionally rare, acromegaly affects about 5 people per million. Males are also twice as likely to get gigantism, and that is reflected in the statistics. This isn't just a road trip to Michigan. We really wanted to make osteology more accessible. This piece was so incredibly rare, we were not able to ship it out from the Anatomy of Death Museum to the Bone Museum, so we physically had to take the journey here to get it ourselves. But it's really our goal to try to bring amazing and historic pieces of medical history to you guys in New York City. So hopefully this could be an amazing experience for all of us. This is Lady Rest Antiques and Oddities. This is located in front of our Death Museum. We are Michigan's only Death Museum. We are the Anatomy of Death Museum. Up here in our oddity space, we sell real human bones. We have dead animals and taxidermy in jars. 
how the collection grew on the human anatomy side of it was we, we have a lot of medical professionals uh, in the area. Grandpa was a dentist, he passed away, they found a human skull that he used in you know, his school down at Wayne State, the dental school. And people would bring stuff in, they didn't know what to do with this stuff. They donate it or I buy it off them. Or a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of anatomy gets thrown away. So my, my passion in life is to preserve the funeral history of our community and also all the medical specimens that we have here uh, housed in our collection. For more on Todd's story, make sure to check out our next video of our tour around the Anatomy of Death Museum, where I was able to share my love for collecting and educating with the general public. We wanted to thank Todd for allowing us to take a chance to visit his space as we were finally able to unravel what we ultimately came here for. All right, everyone, here we are. This is the skull with gigantism. Over my entire career, I have never seen a skull this big before. We came together when this piece first came to the market and thought this would be better at the Bow Museum. So we made this long trip to come personally get this skull. It was so fragile and we wanted to make sure that it wasn't damaged or lost that we decided to come down and get it ourselves. So it's, it's such an honor to be down and thank you so much for sharing this amazing piece of anatomical history with the world. We have more of a funeral home collection than we do an anatomy collection here at our museum. This piece is so special that we thought that it is due its honor of being displayed in the Bowen Museum. We think that displaying this piece here would be a, a good thing for our museum, but to honor what this piece is and the significance of it and the historical presence of it, the only place that this piece would do justice is the Bowen Museum. Well, thank you so much. Let's take a look at this skull and skeleton and see what more it has to offer. Historically, individuals with gigantism would be used for entertainment value within circuses as well as freak shows. We've seen in historical documents they, they would oftentimes join these willingly since it was a good way for them to make money. A historical example of this is Charles Byrne. Charles Byrne is also known as the Irish Giant, and he willingly went to the UK to pursue fame and fortune for his tall stature. However, he openly expressed that after he passes away, he does not want to be put on display. Now, after Charles' death, there was an oddities collector named John Hunter that ended up purchasing his remains despite Charles' original wishes and put his remains on display at the Hunterian Museum. After many years of public debate, the museum eventually removed to Charles' skeleton from public display. Historically, finding skeletons with gigantism or acromegaly is incredibly rare. When I went to my research trip at the Sili Lat Anatomical Museum in Thailand, they had two skeletons on display with gigantism, as well as the Mudur giant and the Irish giant. But finding medical skeletons with these examples are so rare that you can almost name each skeleton that are on display in various medical museums all over the world. Within the context of the Bone Museum, we focus on broader medical history and the history of the medical bone trade. These would be individuals that donated their bodies to science and was later purchased by doctors and anatomists. After they used these bones for their time in medical school, a lot of these doctors would pass away and later their next of kin would inherit these bones and not know what to do with them. The majority of pieces that come into our museum come directly from the next of kin that inherit these bones. The rest come from universities and other institutions. This skull here is a medical skull and looking at it from a historical context for it to exist in this time period, the individual would have had to donate their body to medical science in order for it to be legally procured. There are historic documents of individuals that donate their bodies to science, such as Carol, an individual that had FOP that is currently on display at the Mütter Museum after she was skeletonized in 2017, as she stated that she wanted her body to be used for education, and she now is housed at the Mütter Museum. It's not uncommon for individuals that might have pathologies or cancer to donate their bodies to science, so from looking at this piece from a historical standpoint, it needed to have been donated in order for it to exist. We wanted to acknowledge some of the challenges with gigantism historically, but hopefully this piece can be used for educational value for generations to come. It's so incredibly rare that finding real examples of it is near impossible. Now, gigantism is also often mistaken or lumped together with similar conditions, such as acromegaly or Marfan syndrome. Acromegaly typically occurs in adulthood and is also a result of pituitary tumors. Marfan syndrome presents as elongated limbs and a distinct lanky physique. Now, people with Marfan syndrome are tall, but not abnormally tall. Acromegaly and gigantism have the same underlying pathological cause, but occur at different ages. 
Gigantism is also sometimes referred to as pediatric acromegaly. The first observations of gigantism were recorded by a Dutch physician, Johannes Weyer, in 1567. It wasn't until 1886 that Pierre Marie wrote the first comprehensive paper on acromegaly and gigantism, leading to further research into the condition, eventually linking it to abnormalities in the pituitary gland. The way that we know that this specific individual had gigantism and not acromegaly is because in gigantism, all of the bones grow at the same rapid speed, while acromegaly, only certain features get larger, such as the face, the hands, and feet. Now that you guys have been informed about the history of gigantism and a little bit about how the condition affects an individual, we're going to take a look at the skeleton itself to see any of the indicators that we can learn and compare it versus a normal skeleton. If we look at the skull, primarily we can see that the sutures have been fused. This would indicate that this individual was over the age of 40. Now another interesting call out is if we take a look at this extremely large mandible, this individual had lost two of their molars, one here that naturally healed over, as well as one here. What you're seeing here is the individual most likely lost one of the molars in between, and it caused the mandible to slowly drift over here. So this is not an impacted tooth, this is most likely drifting from losing the second molar. It's so hard to explain this for people watching at home, but this skull is incredibly heavy. I have held hundreds of skulls over my career, and this is probably one of the heaviest I have ever had in my hands. Just look at the mastoid process over here and how large this individual was. Which is really crazy with, because the phragna magnum, which means it's large really hole in Latin, is tiny. Really tiny. Ugh. Crazy. We wanted to really illustrate how large this skull was, so we're gonna bring in an average size skull to really compare and contrast between this skull with gigantism. So if we look here, this is the average size of a skull and just compare it with the size of this skull. Even turning it forward, you can see the brow ridge and just the sheer difference between the two of them. Oh, I don't even know where to Man, begin with this. Gonna... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we <clears throat> yeah, turn it face to face, look at that. This makes it look like a child's skull. Now, let's also look at some of the other bones. So just from there, you can see how large the skull of this individual was, but wait until you see the rest of the bones. Let's take a look at the femur. So not only finding a complete skull is rare enough, but getting the entire skeleton is one in a million. So I'm so honored to be able to have this piece and later displaying it at the Bone Museum. Guys, <laughs> I'm like trying to say this with a straight face right now. This femur is massive. I mean, just look at it compared to Masha's torso. I it am is five foot seven. It's taller than her. It's the length of my arm. Yeah, honestly, look at that. It's crazy. Need I say more? But for scale, let's bring out a typical femur. So just compare and contrast these two femurs, this being one of an average size and this being one of an individual gigantism. This becomes incredibly clear how large this femur was compared to the average. If we look here, there's about six inches of difference. Now every inch, half an inch in the human body counts. It makes a huge difference for, towards your height, your stature, but this is an extreme difference in terms of human anatomy. Now taking a look at this next set of bones, it might be a challenge for us to display sheerly due to the size, but we're gonna do our best. And we're gonna take a look at the entire pelvis. So this is the sacrum of the individual as well as the pelvis. I have seen thousands of sacrums in my career, and this is by far the largest one I have ever seen. But let's put it together to take a look visually at how large this person's hips could have been. Taking both of the pelvises, we would put it together like this and put the sacrum in between, which would fit together, almost taking three hands. Look at that. It's big. I could fit my head in here. Yeah. Look at that. This, this individual could give birth to me, no problem. Does it look huge? All right, at home. So just imagine this and this. It's like, normally when I display skeletons, skulls and skeletons, I could do a pretty good job holding them but like this individual was so large. Man, just look at that. And it just does not stop. These are the ribs of this individual. And uh, you might be thinking, no, they just look like ribs. But Masha, if you care to show. So this is a regular rib. Yep. And this is this individual's rib. It's, it's, it's monstrous. This rib is the thickness of an average fibula. It, it actually it, is. It is. It is night and day. This individual is almost double to triple the size of an average individual. Now, this is a regular scapula. The scapula is your shoulder blade. And now this is a giant scapula. 
Not to sound like a broken record, but I mean, Masha, just fan out your hand. It's like larger than your hand itself. Like, I don't even know where to begin with this piece. Unless you're a medical professional or forensic anthropologist, the average person would never be able to see a real skeleton, let alone an individual with gigantism. We really wanted to make this video to educate you guys more at home to learn more about different medical conditions that exist. And due to the rarity of these pieces, we thought that this would be a great video to really compare and contrast known and unknown medical collections, as well as regular skulls and skeletons versus an individual with gigantism. Here at the Bone Museum, our goal is preservation, and we do not want to damage this piece in any way. Most of the time, modern articulations involves drilling into the bone itself, and we would hate to do it to this piece here. Working with my industrial design background, we want to actually scan this skeleton with 3D imaging and reprint the bones and then articulate it using a replica. That way we don't damage the original skeleton. With pieces as rare as this, it is a long journey around acquiring such rare skeletons and bones. We wanted to really take you through this process to be transparent about how we source our remains as well as topics on restoration and bringing it on display at the Bone Museum. If you found this video interesting, be sure to follow along with this journey on restoring and displaying this skeleton at the Bone Museum in Brooklyn, New York.